So what I want to do this morning is I want to do a very short case study with you that's going to lead us into what we call training for trainers, or T for T. You guys, all over the world, in all of the CPMs that we know of, I'm going to guess that almost half are using one method and almost half are using another method, and only a small percentage aren't using either one of these two. Everyone's using some form of training for trainers, T for T, or some form of what we call DMM, Disciple Making Movements, and they're 95% the same. So in other words, in the last almost 20 years, the Lord's given us over and over an understanding of what kinds of wineskins have to be in place when we raise the sails of the Spirit of God to blow upon them. And so as we talk about this, I want to show you something up here on the screen that I think might be helpful. And we're going to talk about T for T. And some of what we're going to do this morning is going to be like Vince Lombardi with his Packers at the beginning of the season after they won a Super Bowl saying, this is a football. <laughs> this is a football. Some of that's going to be this because you're at a different place now in the process than you were a year ago. And you're going to hear things differently than you heard them a year ago. So we're going to go back and revisit some of the basics as well as some of the, the next step things after the basics. But I want to talk about what we see in this around the world. And remember that T for T is a long-term process. Could you just, can we just say that one phrase together? So what? It's a long-term long -term process. process. Just tell your neighbor that right now. So therefore, what is it not? What is it not? Not short-term, and it's not a set of lessons, okay? This is a process of discipling people. It's a process of multiplying disciples that leads to a church planning movement. That's what we're after. Because we know the only way we're going to effectively get to no place left is for there to be a movement of God. So how do we raise the sails to move the way the Spirit's blowing so that we can get to that point? So I want to show you... What we all learned in the early days from Inkai as he was doing his work in East Asia. And I want to show you a map of this area. I'm going to ask you not to video this part of the screen for a moment, if you would. And I want to show you what Ing did. Ing and Grace. So Laura, uh, is my wife in here? She's going to take a few notes on this case study. And I'll put this up here. Let me paint the picture for you as... Or you, want, you want to take some notes, Jim? Yeah, thanks. Just capture the high points of this case study, you would, bro. Yeah. Jim at night. Yeah. You're going to see a lot of Jim today. Uh, Sorry. Let me paint a picture of Ing and Grace. How many of you guys know Ing and Grace? Okay. Ing was a hospital chaplain. Not what you would call, like, bulldog, over-the-top personality. This guy's just humble, right? Very quiet guy. They went to a training just like this, and they were confronted with one big question. How many of my people will hear the gospel today? They were targeting at that time an area of 19 million people. They were living across the border in Hong Kong and traveling in every day, and they had no clue how do we reach 19 million people. Every year, Ing and Grace, in a very tough place called Hong Kong, would personally lead 40 to 60 people to the Lord and start one new church. There were no missionaries at that time doing anything of that magnitude. We were hoping that missionaries could just start one church every four years. In Grace starting one every year and leading 40 to 60 people to the Lord every year. Remarkable. But when they looked across the border into China, they began to realize what is 40 to 60 million people to 60 people to 19 million? And so there was a big sign in red letters in their training that kept looking at the whole time, how many of my people would hear the gospel today? And it drove them to desperation. Ing and Grace's English is not, it's not their native language. So they missed a lot of what happened in that four-week training. Four-week training. And so they're sitting there, and the whole time they're asking the question, Lord, what can we do that will impact that? And the Lord took them back to the Great Commission. You guys know this part of the story? Yes. What were the big three things the Lord spoke to them out of the Great Commission? What was the first thing? Go, not, Go, not come. And so Ing, it was like a light bulb going on for human grace. It's like we've been telling people, come, invite your friends to our church. And now the Lord's saying to us, we've got to go where they are. Second thing was what? Everybody, don't, don't choose. So they had been guilty of, like I have, 
of looking at people and saying, well, Garrett looks nice. I'll share with him. You know, but Janelle over there, look at that woman. She is intense. I am, I'm afraid of her. I won't say anything. And judging people from the outside. And we have to remember there is no label on people's foreheads saying first, second, third, or fourth soil. We don't know until we cast the seed. So they chose, we're just going to share the gospel recklessly and see what happens. By the way, this doesn't just work in China. We had a team in Indonesia on the island of Sumatra in a very difficult place on the island of Sumatra that were terrified of sharing the gospel with Muslims. And so they came up with what they called the five-minute rule. They knew that if they waited more than five minutes to identify themselves as believers and get to something about Jesus, they never would. So they made a rule as a team. Okay, so Houston, you guys, this, think of this. You might want to do the five-minute rule. They just said, hey, we're going to hold each other accountable to, with every encounter, within five minutes, identify ourselves as followers of Jesus and try to get a spiritual conversation. So it overcame all their fear. So this is what Amy Grace did. And then the third big thing that got out of the Great Commission was what? Make disciples. Make disciples, not simply church members. church members. Okay, And they began to realize if disciples are supposed to make disciples, really that's people are training others to do the same thing they're doing themselves. So let's train people to train trainers who can train trainers who can train trainers. But it was a theoretical idea. So let's say let's go across and let's begin to see what happens. Now, at this point, Amy Grace had three boys still at home. But they were at high school, uh, so they could tend themselves fairly well. So that gave them a bit more freedom. But every morning they would get on a train, leave Hong Kong, travel into China, be there all day, and then they would come back in the evening. Now I want you to hear this part, and Jim, make sure we get this. They only did three things. They didn't develop a website. They have no clue what Facebook is. That they, didn't, they didn't ever make a brochure. They didn't develop any materials other than their lessons. They only did three things. The first thing is every morning they would pray for one to, two, one to two hours. God, open the hearts of people that we're going to talk to today. And give us the boldness. And they would pray for every one of their disciples that they were discipling. That's all they did, pray. When they were done praying, they'd get on the train. And then they would do only the next two things. If they met a lost person, what do you think they did? Share. So think about that five-minute rule. If they met a lost person, they began sharing the gospel. If they met a saved person, what do you think they did? Training. Now, you can't just start training. So they said, hey, this you know, kind of like the coin. Hey, this is what God's plan is for you. He wants you to become a disciple and a disciple maker. When can I meet with you? And they'd pull out their calendar. Now, here's what they would begin doing. Either people that they led to faith or church members or pastors that they would meet, they would begin setting up times to start following up every week. And so they set up appointments for the morning, for two-hour trainings, in the afternoon for two-hour trainings, and then in the evening for two-hour trainings. They began to do that on Monday, then Tuesday. They just began filling up their calendar. Ing is a terrible Sabbath taker. Don't follow his example. Grace chides him on this, but he would even do it seven days a week. And so she has to force him to take a day off. But before you knew it, every week, they were training over 18 groups. They just now, they would get more requests from churches or new people that they led in faith. And so Ing would say, okay, Grace, I'll lead this group at the same time you lead that group over there. And so Grace was training her own groups, sometimes mixed groups, sometimes ladies groups. And pretty soon, over a weekly period of time, they were training 30 to 40 groups every week. Now just think about that. Aaron just showed us numbers. What's going to happen if you start training 30 to 40 groups every week? Something's going to give. I promise you, you will find poor soil. I promise you. And so I was thinking about those numbers, Aaron, you put up there. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, one thing I forgot to say is we accomplished all that in one hour. In one hour, exactly. So Aaron showed you how many were green lights. Now we have to ask the question, how many green lights are going to become people that will be like forest soil bearing fruit? Not all of them will, but we've got to find the green lights first, right? So they began doing that, and then let me tell you what happened. They ran out of time slots on their calendar. 
So does anybody remember how they solved that problem to begin training more groups than the 30 to 40? What did they do? They did every 15 days. Okay, so every other week we're going to meet with you, and that freed up their disciples who had very busy lifestyles to say, on the opposite week, at the same time slot, you train somebody. So if we're meeting Monday nights at 7 p.m., this week I meet with you, next week you train someone else. And the same thing, just what I did the week before, you do with them. And before you knew it, they were training 60 to 70 groups over a two-week span of time. Now, around your tables, I want you to ask, answer this one question. Just from that little tidbit, before I show you any maps, what is there that you learned from what Ing and Grace were doing when they left their training? What are some applications? <clears throat> now, if I were going to guess from my interactions with Ing and Grace over the years, my, my understanding is probably the greatest result came <coughs> from existing believers they met. A lot of results came from people they personally led to faith, but sometimes they would meet. This area is filled with factories. I mean, if you've got Nikes on, they're made there. And the Nike factory, I think, had 100,000 employees at this time. They live on site. Okay, so they were in the factories. They were reaching the medical community. They were reaching universities. They were reaching rural people. Uh, but he had factory owners that he would meet that were believers that say, we want to figure out how to bring the gospel of the kingdom to our factory. So he trained the factory owner who would then go and train their people, or he might go with him to train their people. And I want to show you a little bit of what happened. So on the screen, I want to show you just the first three months, really almost four months. Ing and Grace left the training at the end of November uh, 2001, uh, 2000. And it's the first time I've ever seen anyone actually get to their end vision in like the three years, okay? And so this is their area. You can see here the white part. We're going to zoom in onto that. And what we're going to do is one triangle represents one church. And we have them color code by first, second, third, or fourth, and beyond. Uh, I'm colorblind, so I'll just assume they're up there in those colors. But here is what happened from their beginning to a month and a half later in January, and then, then here's February, and then here's March. And at this point, there's 250 churches. Wow. Now, first of all, Ing's supervisor is having a hard time with this. Ing's envision was... God, would you start 250 churches? So he calls up his supervisor. He said, Bill, Grace and I have a problem. We reached our end vision. What do we do? And Bill very wisely said, keep going. And so let me show you what happened next. Before I do, do you see these little flags popping up? So there was a fourth thing that Ing did, which really is related to this third thing. And that was Ing recognized now with 250 churches, he's got to do leadership development. And so they identified seven places. These were just, at this time, disposable apartments that you could take a contract out for three to six months, train in secret, you know, every week train someone different. And then when the police came in, we just give up what we lost on that thing. And so they identified seven places where they would have some of their, what they would just call their big trainers. They wouldn't tell them, hey, Ray, you're a big trainer. They just knew this guy is responsible for this whole stream. And he'd say, hey, gather some of your folks that have two or three or four generations. Bring them together. We're going to meet together for several days. And it was a, what he calls a mid-level training. Now let me take you to, from 20, 250 to 2,500 churches. This is to take us through the rest of the year. And just watch what happens. This is June, then September, and then December. Now let's keep going. By the way, you think, you think there's nothing happening up here? The problem is we're not getting reports on that area. So everything I'm going to show you here, by the way, let me just tell you, has been vetted. And we've reduced all the numbers I'm showing you by 40%. And here's the reason. We figured there could be some double counting. Uh, we figured at, this was uh, counted by Baptists, and so they were not going to report anything that was not Baptist in flavor. Okay, so if the Presbyterians started something, we blessed them, but we didn't count it on these reports here. So everything you see is discounted, and then you see, still see the training centers popping up. And then I want to show you from January 2002 to March 2003, from 2,500 to 25,000 churches. And so you'll just see the progression of a movement as it keeps going from March to June, to September, to December, to March. Pretty cool? 
Kind of getting close to no place left, huh? Now, let's change the diagram. Let's change the triangle from one church to 25 churches because we've got to get to 100,000 now. So now every triangle represents 25 churches, and we panned out a bit so you can see a larger portion of the map. You can still see the original CPM down there in the beginning, but you see there's already some places in white that have got stuff going. And this is December 2004, 2005, 2006. Ing and Grace about this time came to a mid-level that we were doing. And I'm thinking, why in the world are they coming to us for mid-level? And so they're meeting with this group, and of course they shared their case study, but we said, Ing, Grace, what's next for you guys? And so at this point, they pulled out a map, and they said, of their entire province of 100 million people, they said, right now, we are here, and we are here, and we are here. God's telling us we have to go here, and here, and here. And they had a takeaway from that. And so here you see the, what resulted from that as they began to to help it to expand to other places in that province. Think about 100 million people. It's a huge population. So here's what I want to do. Before we actually jump into the mechanics of what t for t is, and look at that football one more time, I'd like for your team or your group, your table, what are a couple of applications, just from their personal example, that you would say, hey, I need to live that way, or we need to do these things. What are some applications from this? Questions that just came up was, did every T for T group become a church? Uh, in Ng's eyes, yes. But sometimes they were connected to a larger legacy church, especially in China, there's some registered churches, uh, and they had to be very careful. One time they were training that group of 600 I was telling you about, and Grace got up and was, it was her turn to, to train, and she's like, you know, okay, at lesson four, all of you will start churches. And uh, the pastor was like freaking out on the site. And he's telling them, hey, we can't start churches because we'll get closed down by the government. And so uh, they, they took a break and they asked, uh, okay, so um, you can't start churches? No, the government won't let, won't let us start churches. So, so what can you do? Well, we can start, we can start registered <coughs> home Bible studies. Okay, so they got back on the stage. Everybody's going to start registered home Bible studies. And you're going to do all of these things, okay? <laughs> Effectively, they were actually yeah. churches, but legally they had a problem they had to be aware of. So it just depended on their context, but they wanted every group to function as church and, whenever possible, take identity as church. Um, what other questions that just come up immediately? I'll answer a lot here in a minute, but anything that came up as you were talking? What was the pace for a farmer with a job downstream in the movement? Probably not the same. Yeah. As let, me let me tell you about the first old farmer that Ing and Grace, there was a group of 30 people that they trained, they were all farmers. So Ing and Grace uh, trained this group, and the old farmer, they just said, hey, share with five people every week. That's all they asked people to do, share with five people a week. And then if they believe, then you go train them, and train them to share with five people a week, and you know, train them to do the same thing. And so this one old farmer, here's the lifestyle he developed. Uh, in the, he had a, his wife was sort of an invalid. So he would take care of his wife uh, during the day, uh, and work in his field at night and, and during the day, and then about five o'clock, he'd put his tools down, and he would travel out on this little motorbike to a different community that didn't have a church. Uh, that guy, uh, in the first year, through him and his 30 people he had, they, they started 960 churches. What? Now, he didn't start every one of the 960, you know that. But he was the channel through which 960 churches started. And he said, during the, the day, I work the field, and at night, I work God's field. And that was sort of his pace of life. Now, farmers can do that because, I mean, the farm's not going to die if you miss a day. Um, in the factories, they had to figure out times, okay, well, we only have times at night where we can hang out and meet, and they would do that late, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, uh, whatever would work. Uh, sometimes moms in the afternoon, when the kids are in school, it just depended on the pace of life. And they really let people figure out what pace they could live at. That's why the... Every other week thing helped a lot of people in the urban context because they just, they couldn't carve out even two meetings a week. So they couldn't be meeting with Ian and Grace and then have their own group they were meeting with in the same week. So every other week helped them to succeed, succeed sort of a low, you know, easy win for these guys. Someone else, uh, any questions before we jump into, yes ma'am. Did they travel to those more distant places? <coughs> All of those more distant places they sent people to. Mm -hmm. no, none, none of them doing that. 
It all came out of their mid-levels. In fact, eventually, Ing and Grace were doing hardly any frontline training. They're doing only mid-levels because, I mean, think about this, guys. Every month, uh, Ing, with, he had 30, by the end of this, this, this period of time, he had 33 big trainers. Each of these 33 big trainers with to almost 2 million believers total. So you do the math, each one's over, you know, several tens of thousands of believers. And so these guys then are helping to oversee all of these mid-level trainers. And so Ing's only spending his time with the big trainers and the mid-levels. And then eventually he's only spending his time with the big trainers <coughs> because he's facing himself out and Ing's not involved with this at all anymore. This is its own thing. Okay. 